Welcome back to the Journey Podcast. I'm your host, Morgan Debon. I am pumped today because I've got one of my best friends in the entire world joining us today, Mr. Jeff Nelson, my co-founder and someone I have known since I was 17 years old. We're going to talk about, I know I sound old when I say it like that, but it's it's real. And today we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to talk about becoming co-founders and navigating partnerships and uh, business relationships for long-term business relationships. You know, Jeff and I have gone through many a life cycles together and um, he's seen everything from me in a bonnet and a top bun to (laughs) living my best Beyonce glamorous life to everything everything in between. And we're also going to talk about just some of the things related to there's just a lot going on in the world and we have a different perspective, a unique perspective as business owners, as people of color, and also as people trying to make a difference in the world under these constraints of the economy, of this political system. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the current events that are happening related to DE&I and all things capitalism. And then lastly, uh, Jeff is also one of the smartest people I know. So we'll talk a little bit about AI and technology. So this is going to be a bit of a random episode. Thank you all for listening. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribing to the YouTube channel. We're going to keep releasing new and fun things there. Make sure you're on my weekly newsletter that goes out, lots of freebies and downloadables that are coming out soon. Also, please rate and subscribe to the podcast on Spotify and Apple. Hey, everyone. I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With The Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Jeff Nelson, how yes. are you? Doing? I'm doing well. I am doing well. How are you? I'm doing fine. I would well, say I didn't sleep well last night. So Well, you're glowing and you look good. So you you look no worse for wear. So it's it's, it's it's giving, you know, I got good lighting in the house. See that? Good, good production, you know? You, you got it. You got it. Good <laughs> so just a little bit about you, just to, to provide some context for folks. How do you describe yourself? Like if you meet somebody yeah. and they're like, hi, and you're like, hi, I'm Jeff. What do you say? Yeah, it's hard because I don't fit into, I don't neatly fit into boxes, right? So just kind of high level summaries, right? Obviously is the co-founder, uh, technical co-founder and CEO of Blavity, overseeing data engineering product and all that stuff, among other things. I'm a technologist, right? So software engineer, techie, AI, data, all those things. But really, I'm I'm so much more dynamic than that. I think a lot of times people hear that and they're like, oh, you know, they they sort of have this picture of me in their mind. And I get so much feedback from people when they actually meet me, they actually hear or see me speak or they interact with me. They're like, you are so different than what I assumed, right? And that's because like so many of my interests are in the arts and creative spaces and politics and in the world, right? So I'm really kind of like this cosmopolitan, kind of worldly, sophisticated, just a person that is interested in in life, right? So it's hard to, when I describe myself, it really depends on the space I'm in and and really how I want to navigate that space. Um, I usually lead with the tech because I think that tech is the future, obviously, and that it touches so many things now that it allows me to easily kind of branch into whatever else I want to, but it's so much more than the tech though. Yeah, it's it's funny because, you know, Blavity, we started off with four of us. So I have mm-hmm. three other co-founders, you, Jonathan Jackson, and Aaron Samuels. And because of how we've had to tell the story, you know, mm-hmm. you have to personify everybody when you're telling a founder's story. So it's like, you know, I started the company and I'm the visionary public figure, back-end strategist. Jeff is this, mm-hmm. you know, technical guy. Aaron is the money guy and like the yeah. business, you know, wheeling and dealing, like super smart guy. And Jonathan was like the people's man, you know, Mm -hmm. and you just have to come up with these characters oftentimes to get people to buy into the story and to even for your own employees, really, for people to figure out, well, who do I go to for this question? Do I go to Jeff? Do I go to Morgan? Do I go to Aaron? Do Mm -hmm. I go to Jonathan? And I think that in the beginning, at least for me, sometimes it was really limiting because I'm like, well, I, Mm -hmm. I can 
do revenue you could, or like you could be the money you could be the money person you could be the people person you could also yeah. be the tech person i mean one one thing that i always give you props for is that you know in the early days you were not the type of ceo who was like hey from from a tech standpoint we need to build this thing and why is it taking so long and you know you need to do this you were like hey you were learning css you were learning on um, little things like, you could do the color, i'll change like, the you, button exactly you so, so to, to your credit like you you were able to do all the things and willing to do all the things, but you're right. It's, you know, to cleanly tell stories, but also in a world where we were doing something like, you know, this was 2014, 2015, when we were kind of launching and raising, yeah. people hadn't seen that from a black woman, a millennial with your background and that story, people hadn't seen that before. So in many ways you have to kind of craft this narrative that is limiting to you and yeah. to the rest of us so that people can wrap their brains around it and then quickly move on to like, okay, cool. Like what's the business? How are you making money? Et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I, I feel you. I feel you on that. Yeah. Nobody was really trying to hear, well, I like art and I have these, all these mm -hmm. hobbies, and, you know, well, Jeff actually has another startup that he's working on exactly. and he likes to travel and well, actually Aaron's in B school. Nobody actually wants to know. No one, nobody wanted to know that. Right. <laughs> which, I, which I think the truth of it is if you actually know the fullness of the four of us, right? And all yeah. the things that we were doing and all the things that we can do, it, it just makes it even more incredible, right? But we have to just kind of scale it down to get people to, to give us a chance. Keep it simple. And I, yeah. I think, you know, I share that partially because on this podcast, we talk about our journeys, we talk about mm -hmm. how we got here. And a lot of times, once you see someone at a certain level, you're also omitting all of the mm -hmm. things that got them there. And yeah. it can be easy to say, oh, well, like, this makes sense. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, actually, it didn't make sense. And we had to craft a narrative, craft a story that would hit the media, hit our investors, mm -hmm. our prospective employees in a way that they could understand and latch on to the story and sign on <laughs> to yeah. do something that was literally almost impossible and want to be a part of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully for anyone who's listening in, if you feel like you have to simplify your story, even if you are a complicated being, just know mm -hmm. it, it can be temporary if you tell yourself that it's temporary and then you can start to expand. Jeff, as you think about kind of our journey and where we started, what are the things that are the moments where you're like, I was super proud of this? Well, I'll answer that in two ways. One, I think for me personally, but then also as a company, and I'll start with us as a company. I think when we launched the first Afrotech in, in 2016, one, just the lead up to Afrotech, right? So for, for people who may be unfamiliar with the Blavity story, the company started in 2014 with our media brands. We, we built Blavity, we, be, we built 2190. But then in 2016, you had this vision of like, we should do a conference, right? And and one, just, you know, people who know you, they know that you're just a bold thinker. And you're and you're and you say things and people are like, what really? And and we and we do it, right? And so I think the lead up to doing it was audacious in and of itself. Yeah. When I think back to the past Afrotech, you know, in, in 2023, we had 30,000 people. We started with 500 people in a mall in San Francisco with begging for sponsors, right? Now we've got over 200 sponsors. We barely could get the, the eight sponsors we had for the first year to show up, right? Yeah. So the, the planning of that was audacious. But if anybody knows what happened in 2016, and, you know, we're going to talk about just kind of the state of the world later. There was an election. It didn't go how people thought it was going to go. It was in November. Afrotech uh, was the day after the election started. So the world, there was just a, a jolt to the world. Regardless of what you wanted to happen in that election or not, sort of the natural order of what was supposed to happen was turned on its head. And mm -hmm. so many people felt so many emotions about that. And, you know, I remember I was just like, are we still going to do Afrotech? Are people still going to show up? Like, yeah. what? <laughs> I, I couldn't make sense of left or right or up or down, right? And we we went through with it and it was not only successful, but it was needed. It was necessary. And I think that I'm just so proud of us for being audacious and even in the face of adversity. Like I think of the Afrotech after that or the, the second or third one when when there was a strike. We were in the middle of of a of a big strike. And again, at, at all these moments, we had these decisions to make during COVID, right? We were the first ones to do the metaverse. So I think I'm just proud and thinking about our journey where we're always hit with adversity, right? Yeah. And and we always choose to be audacious. And I really give you credit as our leader for setting that tone, right? For me personally, when I think about our journey, I think about, again, being hit with adversity. For me, it's tragedy, right? The early years of us 
astounding blavity. I had so much personal tragedy. My sister was killed. My dad died. My daughter was uh, born prematurely. My wife had multiple deaths in our family. It was like every year, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And so to to build a company in the midst of that, in some ways it's like escapism, but it's hard. And it's hard when you have to be there for yourself, your family, for so many people and they depend on you. Yeah. And, and I'm just sort of proud of myself for not only sticking with it, but really setting an example for myself and my family that tragedy does not have to define or break you. Right. Mm. You can make room to obviously process the tragedy and give it its just due in terms of grieving and and all those things. But life is so dynamic and complex that you don't box yourself into just being defined by the tragedy. Right. Mm -hmm. You still got other things to do. Yeah. And I would also say knowing you and knowing you in different moments of your life from Mm -hmm. being student body president, you know, advocating for students on campus to being one of the first people at WashU really to go and work in Silicon Valley, working at Palantir, then to be in a long distance relationship. And, you know, you were the first person yeah. that you got married early. I was I like, married, I damn. This is, this this is 10 years, good years, 10 years this year, right? <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, yeah. You, you got married the year of Blavity basically got founded, exactly. right? Yeah. And, you know, you were the first one to have kids. Like, it's just... You did a lot of things for the first time. And then to your point, you know, there were, you just had some tough, tough yeah. years. And I think sometimes when I look back at our employees and I look at different phases of the company, there's definitely moments where I'm like, man, I feel bad for some of the employees who were our employees during like certain mm-hmm. like a six month yeah. period of time. If somebody started and quit within like a year of a certain time frame, I'm like, yeah, I don't blame you, sis. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> a lot. It was a lot. But, but we've also got some OGs, you know, that stuck. That have been there since pretty much that first year, right? That first or second year that are, that, are, that stuck with it and grew and now are just major forces of leadership within the company. So absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. But more of just to say that, like, you know, everybody does have phases. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes people's bad phase or good phase may be your only introduction to them. and. Correct. I think one of the things that I love about our relationship is that we've both had good phases and bad phases and we've Mm -hmm. made it through all of those things enough so that I know when you're in a good vibe, like there'll be Mm -hmm. a three month period of time where I'm just like, I need you to tap in. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Like I need you locked in Mm -hmm. for the next quarter and vice versa where I'm like, look, I am not going to be locked in. Like I need you. It's and and I remember I, I vividly remember the, both those conversations times when you have told me I needed to lock in or you needed support and I think that's interesting when I think our story as co-founders and friends is so unique and atypical you know I always tell people like I don't do business with friends or family right but then they they say well didn't you go to college and aren't you friends with all your co-founders? Like, you know, I, you and I were friends in college. Like, you know, we were student body. I was student body president. You were my vice president. Then you were student body president. I was your RA. We were friends. Aaron, I was his mentor. Like Aaron, when he was a pre-freshman, literally I hosted him and he slept on my dorm room floor. And, and, you know, he, he used to, it's so funny because he, used to look up to me so much. And now I'm just like, you know, it, it's it's weird because Aaron is doing so many great things. And I'm just like, wow, this guy used to look up to me. Now I'm just like, well, I want to be like Aaron in, in, yeah, in some ways, right? Yeah, like a $100 million fund now. Yeah, exactly. Just doing amazing things, right? And I think what has made our business relationship work is that there is that space, that there is that love, there is that respect, yeah. um, but there is that accountability where you can come to me and say, I need you to do X, Y, Z, or hey, like what you're doing isn't working. Like we, we need to shift this. Or you can come to me and say like, this is tough for me. I need more support. Yeah. And, and it's being able to have those conversations and one, be able to receive it in general, but then two, not receive it begrudgingly and say, well, I no longer like this person or they don't like me or they're being mean. It's yeah. like, no, like ultimately we're, we're having these conversations because we both care about the business. We both yeah. care about each other. And right. we're, we're really just trying to make it happen. What advice would you give to people who are thinking of starting a company or starting an enterprise or nonprofit or any sort of big commitment with somebody that they know? What advice would you give them? Would you say don't do it? So I, I would say don't do it with caveats. And here's a funny story that I don't know if you remember this. It was one. So my birthday, I'm a, I'm a Capricorn. My birthday is in December, right? So end of December, 
which is the time nobody is on campus, right? Because everybody's gone home for winter break. It was one year, like really close to my birthday. You're from St. Louis, right? Your, your family lived there. And I remember, I don't know if you had me drive out to your parents' house or if it was your grandparents' house, but it was like, it seemed really, really far out, right? Um, yeah. yeah you were like, and you wanted me to, I think this was my first time in your parents. And I remember you gave me a birthday card. And the birthday card said something like, happy birthday to my best friend. And I remember on the cover, I remember reading it. I was like, oh, shit. Wow. Oh, she thinks we're best friends. And then on the inside, it said, JK, you're not my best friend. But something like to the effect of like, you know, we're, we're, I appreciate you, yada, yada. And, and that story, that, that story is so funny to me. Relationships obviously have so much range. I think someone who is truly your best friend, which is like, you are my go-to for everything. Yeah, you should not start a business with that person. Yeah, right. And you and I, our, our relationship in college and even now has always been there as a closeness. But you're, we're not going to come to each other for everything. But there's also like a significant life events. We're, we're obviously in each other's lives, but there's there's sort of like this healthy sort of like, hey, this is a person that I respect, I love, I'm close to. But it's like I'm not. This isn't my the person I need for everything. Right. Yeah, I don't text Jeff every day. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And so I think that that works. Right. When you have someone where there is respect, there is a relationship where, you know, you care, but that's not the person you're like texting good morning to every day. Right. Then you can then you can build a business. Right. Because then you can sort of have those moments in that relationship where you can have difficult conversations and quickly rebound from them. Or you can have conversations where it's like, hey, like, like I got a lot going on. I'm not going to be able yeah. to pull my weight. And you can have right. those conversations. So that's one piece of advice I would say is like, if you want to start a, a business with someone you know, don't do it with your person. Don't do it with your partner. Don't do it with your spouse. Don't do it with your best friend. Because if things go wrong, if things go south or things are not going well and, and tough decisions have to be made, how is the relationship going to be impacted by that? Like, I, I even know at Blavity, there have been times where you know, I've wanted to do things and you were like, no, Jeff, like, actually, no, like we either because you didn't think it was a good idea and you, and you were right. It was like I was what I was optimizing for was not what the business needed or maybe we try something. And I was like, oh, like, just give me six more months. And you're like, no, we're losing too much money on this. We got to yeah, afford six right? more months. We, we can't afford six more months. And to be able to have those conversations and yeah. for that to not affect our personal relationship, because I'm not taking it like well, you're this and you should just support me blindly, et cetera, right? The yes. second thing I would say, and this is true for any co-founders, whether you're friends or not, understand how you process information and see the world and how they process information and see the world. Mm. One thing that I think was really important was, you know, when we all took like the Myers-Briggs personality assessment mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm an engineer and most people will probably assume that I'm all logical and everything is just like objective, boom, boom, boom. But actually the way, like I'm an E, like I process everything emotionally. Oh Whereas my you, gosh. you're an I, like you and Aaron, you, you two are the eyes, right? And it's, everything is just sort of objective, black and white. Yes. And the reason that's important is because then when you have differences of opinion, you understand what everyone's basis is, right? Yes. And so there've been conversations you and I have had where, is like, hey, Jeff, like, I know you care about this person. Yes. So how can we find a solution where you don't feel like you're betraying this person or you can still care about them, but also we can make a decision that is best for the business, best for the numbers, right? And, and having that empathy, right? Or conversely, when you're doing something I'm like, hey, like, okay, Morgan, this is, they're actually people. Yeah, we'll be like, Let me this. Like, this is the, I'll be like, Jeff, this is the outcome we need. Right. <laughs> we, right. One of two ways. Yeah. And you it's like, okay. it or I can handle it. <laughs> right. Exactly. And it was, then it's like, okay, now I understand what you're optimizing for, what I'm optimizing for. And then we, we game plan it. And I think that's why this has been able to work. So those two pieces of advice, right? So not your partner, your BFF for life and yeah. make sure you understand how they think and see the world and how you think and see the world so that you can really have conversations where you're well informed to have context. Absolutely. And and I think just appreciation for both characteristics. And I think people should take personality tests more often. So I think so actually too. we probably overdue for a personality test. Because it does again. change. It, it, it changes. Change. Mm -hmm. And I think I've, I don't know that I've changed. I think I've probably doubled down. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you've been slightly changed. Yeah. Now yeah. you've got like less personal chaos. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah. trap and just all types of stuff. I think that you're probably a little more. Probably a little more. You know, probably evenly split between the E and the I, probably in the middle somewhere, maybe. Hopefully. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I'll put that on my to-do list for the year. Well, yeah. I was actually thinking that we should just hire an executive coach for all of us. Yeah. What do and, you think about that? Yeah. I, I think that's a good idea because, you know, you get to a, a point when you've been doing this for so long that obviously you have blind spots. Yeah. But then there are ways that you have new problems, right? At this level, we have new yeah. problems, both just because of the size of the company, two, because of the world. Like the world is changing. Our business is changing, Yeah. right? You know, when you're a founder, you have to be scrappy and you, you have the luxury of being able to kind of build a plan while you're flying it and figure things out on the fly. Mm -hmm. When you're a company that employs 200 people mm -hmm. and is really an important brand like we are, you you really can't figure everything out on the fly. Some things you can maybe play around with, but having that coaching, I think, is extremely important. I was thinking about getting one for all of us at the executive level, just deciding like what three to four problems we want to work on together mm -hmm. as a group and like what we want to be coached through, just because it is an evolution, right? I mean, I was 24, you were 26 26, yeah. 26? Yeah, when we started the company. So wow. it requires different skills to run a business doing over a hundred million dollars in revenue yeah. than it does building a business from a whiteboard <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. Upwork. <laughs> it's a shout out to Upwork. So yeah, that, that's one of the things that I'm thinking about for this year. How are you processing the fact that one of the reasons we started the company was to provide a platform and build platform and community and network for Black consumers, Black people, Black professionals, with the fact that it feels like we're going backwards. Like it feels mm -hmm. like actually the health outcomes for Black folks is worse than it mm -hmm. was. The wealth gap is worse than it mm -hmm. was. The representation in you know Black people as CEOs of publicly traded companies, worse. Mm -hmm. Like, do you ever feel demotivated? Yeah, it's scary. And, and I do want to underscore what you're saying. And I think a perfect example of it is like, D, E, and I. Whether you want to call it D, E, and I, whether you want to call it diversity hiring, inclusivity, whatever you want to call it. You know, it used to be that companies were either like, yeah, DEI is important or mm -hmm. ah, we don't care. That used to be sort of the two options. Now we're in a world where strangely, there's this sort of third faction of people who are like, no, actually, if you believe in D, E, and I, or you believe in specifically trying to make spaces more inclusive, you're actually mm -hmm. wrong. You're racist. Like, it's actually like, it, it isn't just like DI, yay, or like, ah, I don't care. It's actually like, no, DI means you are a bad person. Right. And you see that in prominent spaces. I mean, it's not just like fringe people and mm -hmm. then fringe people who are um, having those views elevated. And I'm not going to call out any names, but there are prominent people in tech in well, we government, in politics. Musk and the Lululemon CEO. I mean, it's I podcast. Mean, it's like you know what? Back. Let's call him out. Let's call him out. I mean, Elon Musk is, is, is a good example, right? The, the Lululemon CEO is, is a good example. I mean, there are people who are now like, hey, DE&I and wanting to hire Black people and, and, and intentionally going into spaces and saying like, look, it is important for us to have a workforce or a student body or whatever we are. It is important for us to have people that are not just monolithic. Right. Data supports it. Yeah. And so there are so many reasons why this is important. We're now in a world where there's so much hostility towards that. And so yeah. in some ways it's demotivating just because it does feel like we're going backwards to a point where a few years ago I couldn't envision what my parents went through. And it was acceptable living through Jim Crow and the struggle for civil rights. Mm -hmm. I was like, it actually used to be the case that people would not serve black people in diners and people were just like, that was like the norm. It sounded ridiculous. Yes. But now you can actually envision that because there are now so many spaces where being hostile to women, being hostile yeah. to people who are LGBTQIA, people who are um, black, people who are underrepresented right. is actually a badge of honor. You can actually envision that happening. So in some ways it's demotivating, but what the flip side to that is, I go back to why we started Blavity in the first place. And we started Blavity because we knew that there needed to be a space where Black people were able to safely see each other and be seen, first and foremost. And then 
be seen by the world, right? Mm -hmm. We needed that space where we could sort of, you know, shut out the noise because that's what we had in college. Like whatever was going on on campus, the black table, right? That's what Blavity and Black Gravity was. It was the ability for us to come together and have one another no matter what. And so I think we need those spaces more than ever. I think that in 2014, we needed those spaces. Now in 2024, we need those spaces more than ever. So the mission and vision of Blavity is so much more important. So yes, it's demotivating, but it's also like we double down and we say like, look, we have to do this work. We don't do this work just because it's cute and it's fun. It's hard work. Right. But without us, I think the problem is much worse, right? We've got yeah. to keep fighting. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, would you sell Afrotech? And as you know, I have thought about selling mm -hmm. business at various We have. We've had many conversations about it, yeah. One of the things that always is really hard for me is if we sell it, will it cease to exist? Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, most acquisitions fail and- I really have a point of view, and maybe it's an outsized personal set of responsibility. I don't know if it's right or too much or if it's not enough, but my perspective is that Afrotech can't not exist. Mm -hmm. Like the world isn't there yet. I do think we're better than we were when we first started. Like there's so many people interested in, in technology. There's so many people in our community now. There's little fractions of Afrotech. You know, there's Black Tech Atlanta. There's Black mm -hmm. Tech Week, da, da, da. There's all these right. different smaller groups, which is amazing. We couldn't possibly serve everyone. But I also believe that it's not just about, hey, come to this event and have a good time. It's actually that we are forcing these companies mm -hmm. to make an investment mm -hmm. and to show up and then to make a commitment that is visible. Because mm -hmm. when the commitment is visible, it's easier to yes. hold them accountable to it. It's harder to all of a sudden stop doing it, mm -hmm. right? Like, Companies who are sending their employees to Afrotech, who have employees who are speaking at Afrotech, talking about their technology, talking about the innovation that they're doing, and getting business results from it, getting better recruits from it. It's hard then to say, actually, we shouldn't be in these spaces. It's mm -hmm. racist for us to spend money sponsoring these spaces. It's like, mm -hmm. how is this racist? We're getting more customers. We're mm -hmm. evangelizing our mission, our values, and our innovations. We're having highly engaged employees and giving them spaces for thought leadership, like what's racist about that? Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. And I, I think one of the things you're kind of alluding to is that as a founder, you, you sort of are always optimizing for so many things. Like first and foremost, you think about your own journey, your own personal journey and mm -hmm. you know what you want out of the world. We've been building this thing for 10 years. Right. And, and so sometimes it's like, look, we built a great thing. Right. Is it time to sell yeah, it and, and cash in, in? You know, like <laughs> cash in, because as we started off talking about, all of us are so multifaceted. There are so right. many things that we want to do, that we can do, that we are doing that, you know, if we had time to, to think about those things, could we have impact in a different way? So part of it is, is this assessment of like, OK, what do I personally want? But then you also have like, what is my responsibility in the world. You're right. It's like Afrotech. And, and you and I have had these exact conversations. Like if we sell this, does it die? And how do we feel about that? Right. Yeah. And if, if we sell it and it dies, how do we show up in the world and replicate and extend that impact in different ways? Mm -hmm. You know, Afrotech is, is still owned by Blavity. We still own Blavity. Like we're, we're still running the company. So we're not selling. We're yeah. Not yeah. We're not doing any of that. Right. So we all personally and, and sort of for the sake of the business and where we think about our responsibility being, you know, we're still the ones operating the company um, in yeah. Afrotech. I think you are right that we are in a place. Like I know people, I've spoken to people who have, you know, people I mentor when they're looking for job offers. I've had quite a few people say like, I'm going to choose this offer because I know that they sponsor Afrotech and I may get a chance to go. Like they may be able to give me a ticket to Afrotech, That's right? That's so awesome. It's one just to to know that we have such an impact that like people yeah. people say money people look forward to this the day after the conference they're looking forward to next year's conference, right? Yeah. So you're right. We we created we've we've made it hard for people who have been doing this to suddenly become yeah. hostile towards it. Mm -hmm. Right. But when the world and the the world around us seems to be in retrograde, it's like well while we have made progress, there's still more work to do. And, and so that's why that dilemma exists.
you know, I think we should be doing more policy work with Afrotech. I think we should be, there's so many things that happen. I'm like, man, we should issue a statement. We should be doing mm -hmm. more lobbying on behalf of this interest group that we represent. And yet at the same time, I'm like, man, we're tired, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. How do you feel about the next phase for us? Do you feel like you want to start to do some of those things? I do. And what I've noticed, you know, we've had a lot of engagement uh, over the past year with Congress and the White House. Mm -hmm. And those relationships are interesting because as a media company, to some extent, the way that they initially view us is like a public relations arm. It's like, hey, yeah, let's let's have Blavity here and do a photo op with, um, yeah. you know, the president or the vice president. And we want Blavity to talk about all the good things that the administration yeah. is doing. And and sure, like those things are cool. Being at the White House is cool. Being able to go to Congress and meet with these people, right now, right. it's, it's cool. But you can't get caught up in that and just be a fan. You have to sort of realize that by having access to those spaces, you have, we have a responsibility to yeah. advocate. And we are, you know, this year, in addition to just sort of wanting to encourage people to understand that there's an election and the importance of voting, making sure that people are informed about issues, right? Not who you should vote for, not, you know, this is the way you should think, but we live in a world where there's so much misinformation. There is so much noise mm -hmm. that I think we have a responsibility we want to educate people, but we also have a responsibility to educate these institutions that millennial voters and Gen Z, we actually want to see the world look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And for us, the choice of, you know, it used to be, well, you know, if you don't vote or if you don't show up, it was kind of lesser of two evils. And I'm not, not saying what that is in this election, but I do think that mm -hmm. politicians need to understand increasingly that they will be held accountable. Do you actually oh, yeah. believe that? I don't feel like our politicians are held accountable for their bad mistakes and their bad choices. Like we had an entire congressperson who was literally a fraudster and he's mm -hmm. like on TV. Like you are rewarded. How do you get here? How can you fraud your way to Congress? Like what? So I think we, I, that, that's an interesting point. I, I think that for some people, that sort of like trolling and, and just like dishonesty, like that's actually the, the game. Like George Santos, he didn't do anything that he shouldn't, like that's actually the game. It's, it's to make a mockery of government. It's to make a mockery of the, the entire process. And people are rewarding that because they're like, yes, like you're, you're owning the liberals or you're doing whatever, right? So I get what you're saying, which is like, to some extent, what does accountability look like? Like what does accountability for elected officials actually look like? What I think it looks like for serious politicians is if you want to continue to serve and you want to continue to be elected, you want to continue to hold power, right? You want people to show up. If you want people to not sit at home, essentially, because elections are not one on changing minds. Elections are one on turnout. And so I'll use President Biden yeah. as an example. President mm -hmm. Biden, whatever you think about him or not, the whether he is going to be reelected or Donald Trump is going to come back and be reelected or any other Nikki Haley, whomever else, what that is going to depend on is not if you're going to change somebody's mind. Everybody's mind is made up. It's whether you're going to get yes. them to come out and vote for you. And right. for President Biden, for for any politician, that is where the accountability lies. And it's going to be, it's not going to be on, well, are you better or are you the lesser evil than this other person? Evil. It's going to be about, these are the things that affect me and that I care about. These are the things yeah. you said you do. Did you do them? Did you make progress? And do you have a, a realistic plan going forward if you get another four years to do those things? What's challenging is, and I, I probably tend to be more of the Charlemagne in this mm -hmm. argument, but like, I believe that they take us for granted, that they take Black consumers and Black voters for granted. And I feel like there were a lot of commitments made and some commitments have been managed, but a lot of things have happened that I'm like, how are you going to expect Black folks to show up for you? So, How are you going to expect yeah. for Black people to get out and go and vote for you? People are struggling right now. They, you I know, think that's where the disconnect that's is. That's the problem. Th that's the disconnect. And, you know, the administration, um, and I, again, I'm not promoting the administration or, or touting their line, but I think this is where the disconnect is. The administration will say, well, they'll point to symbols. First woman vice president is a Black woman. First Black woman Supreme yes. Court, they'll point yes. to those symbols. But what I think the administration yeah. has to realize is that those symbols are cute. That progress means a lot. But 
yeah. for everyday people, for everyday people who are like, I am struggling to pay bills. Whether there's a black Supreme Court justice or a black woman vice president, he's not going to pay their bills, right? And so that's where I think that there's a disconnect. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's taking for granted, but I think that it is the people who are in those rooms, like, and that's why it's so important to have like Blavity and us in those rooms, because the people who are in those rooms, like there are people who have been here, like the, you know, love Al Sharpton to death, but the Al Sharptons of the world, in, in some ways they are out of touch because they are, they're sort of like the professional black person in the room that they don't really yeah. understand the everyday, they're not advocating for the everyday struggle, they're advocating for the symbols, right? That's oh. Right. President Biden, you've got to go to a black church. No, it's like you got to actually make our lives better and easier on a day to day basis. Yeah, yeah, we don't care if you went to Baptist church. Exactly. Like, what's going on with the jobs? I saw a graphic come out from the White House that was like jobs created by Joe Biden. And mm -hmm. it was all of the Republicans and yeah. like how many jobs they created. I think it was like Trump created jobs. I think under George mm -hmm. Bush, it was like negative jobs. And right. then Biden was like this giant like leap up. Yeah. But in my head, what I said was, but that's because everybody got laid off <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's because mm -hmm. all these people lost their jobs and now people mm -hmm. have two jobs. That's right. why there's more jobs. And I think that's why it's so weird because people, you know, you look on the commentary and they're like, oh, the economy and the unemployment rate is this. They look at the data, right? As a, as yeah. a person that's in the data, there's data, but then there's the story behind the data, right? You've got to actually look and, and say like, yes, like are people working two jobs? Like that to me, like if we've got job growth because people are work, having to work two jobs, that's not that's good not job good. growth. That's not good job growth, right? So I, th I think you've got a point there. And, I, and the administration has to figure that out. I think politicians who, serious politicians who want to be elected, like in some ways, I think that there are politicians who have a cult following. Like I'm yes. trying not to be political. I can't be political. Like I'm trying not to be political on your show. I don't want to get you canceled or anything. You like can that. be political. But it's I can my be, show. Yeah. Donald Trump has a cult following. Yeah. So, so none of the rules. Are, yeah. Here's my perspective. Mm -hmm. We all tiptoe so much. Who okay. are we worried about setting? We you, work for ourselves. You're right. You're right. Okay. If I get fired, just know, you know, Morgan told me I can say it, right? <laughs> if Morgan fires me for saying what I'm about to say. <laughs> time, time to go Cat Williams style. Just just let it I'm out, right? <laughs> but, you know, Donald Trump has a cult following, right? The MAGA right wing, that is a cult. It, it is because there's no logic in that support, right? But for non-MAGA, like at, at some point, Donald Trump is going to go away. That atypical figure is going to go away. So whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, you have to understand that at the end of the day, you are going to be judged and people are going to turn out for you if what you are doing in your office actually makes their lives better and the lives of the people they know about. Yeah. From, a, from a number standpoint, like, yes, Biden has passed a lot of legislation. Numbers are, you know, this and that. And there are many reasons for that. But there was a point in time in, in 2019 when COVID hit and the pandemic happened, the world turned upside down. The world is still upside down. And that's what, pe <laughs> that's what people are upset about. They're like, the world is still off. I don't know whose fault it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's COVID. Or, but the world is still upside down. So when they, in November, they're like, the world's still upside down. I don't, I'm not going to vote. Or I voted this way and it's still upside down. And so they get disillusioned. I agree. And I think what's going to be challenging is uh, I think Trump's going to win. And I know I shouldn't say that because people will be like, if you say it, then it's blah, 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 <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, we are very connected to the day to day of mm -hmm. what the black sentiment is and mm -hmm. um, what people care about, and the issues people care about. And unfortunately, I think people are going to be disengaged and mm -hmm. not want to vote for the current White House and mm -hmm. the current administration not necessarily that they want to vote for Trump, but they don't want to vote for the administration either. Right. And I think that he'll get back in office and he'll continue to do his fuckboy shit that he's been doing for the last four years or more since he's been out of office, even like crazy stuff. And I think there will be more and more of a disconnect between our federal government and the people. Yeah. And yeah. It'll be just like it is in other countries where there's a huge disconnect between the federal government and the people in power and the everyday people to the point where people are just like, I mean, it's just, you know, yeah. they're just talking to each themselves and they're just like very corrupt. And mm -hmm. there are countries that exist that way. Many, 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 many countries that exist that way. Americans always feel like we're better than everyone else, but actually like we're not. Mm -hmm. anymore yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that that's especially scary because you know we live in a world where there's 
big stuff happening like AI. AI is is such an interesting piece of technology. And it used to be that, you know, when when these new technologies were developed, the United States was able, and I'm going to use good in air quotes because some people don't view us as, as a force for good, but right? But we were able to sort of harness and police these technological advancements and make sure that they were used for good because we Dang. had competent leadership. Now, now we're in a place where our leadership is theatrical. Like our government is mm-hmm. theater. It's a reality TV entertainment show. I mean, George Santos, you, you referenced him earlier, I think is a good example of that where politicians are just reality TV stars and government mm-hmm. is the arena of conflict and it's entertainment. Yeah. We're at a point now where our government is just, and our politics is so unserious, but other countries, whether you view them as adversaries or not, China, Russia, other countries like that, right. who have dictators, right, who don't have to deal with what we deal with, they are also building these technologies. And how are they going to deploy yes. them? How is China going to leverage AI and deploy it in the world, right? How is Russia yeah. going to use AI and deploy it in the world? How is North Korea Gonna, you know, and, and so we're at a point now where we're so unserious and the rest of the world has access to the same information that we have access to. They have access to the same capabilities and, and we're kind of just playing games when the rest of the world is doing who knows what. So that, that part is really, really scary. Yeah, I think it's scary. And also it is going to become one of those things. I think it's just going to sneak up on the everyday person, mm-hmm. right? Where yep. We as Americans feel like we're the best. And actually, it's like, actually, we're not the best. China's the mm-hmm. best. Mm-hmm. Okay. Their economy is struggling right now. But that's temporary. Mm-hmm. They're going to figure it out. And, mm-hmm. you know, Ray Diallo actually talks about this quite a bit for anyone who's listening who wants to hear more about it. It's called The Changing World Order. It's a book that he wrote that talks about how this America is on the decline of being the biggest and baddest in the world Mm -hmm. in the same way that Britain was on a decline and a new world order happened with America. We're on the decline. China's on the incline. And then eventually in our lifetime, our children's lifetime, China will be the new world order dominant. I think technology will play a huge, huge part of it and labor. Mm -hmm. You know, China (laughs) is willing to do things we're not willing to do. Um, and as it relates to AI, it's very, very interesting. I think chat GPT five is going to come out this year. Bill Gates and Sam Altman just did a podcast together. You know, two very potentially kind of sort of evil, but not evil people. It's really depends on, it depends on the day. Wake up on the right or wrong side of the bed that day. Right. It's really weird how they've like, how they yeah. exist in the world, but um, they were talking to each other and Sam Altman was talking about how ChatGPT5 is coming out and it's going to have access to video mm-hmm. and it can make video mm-hmm. and process information data from video. Mm-hmm. So in a world in which we thought and the average consumer thinks if it's on video, it's real. Got proof. It's, how do you... Do, how do you manage generative AI on video... It's, you know, there, there's the phrase, uh, sort of old black grandma phrase, you know, don't believe uh, your lying eyes, right? Which is sort of to say, like, if you see it, right, your eyes won't lie to you. Your eyes don't play tricks. But now your eyes can't play tricks on you because what is being fed to you may or may not be true. And, yeah. and there are many reasons why that's scary. But I remember, you know, just thinking about the context in which Blavity was started, 2014, around mm-hmm. the time when Trayvon Martin was murdered. And we thought mm-hmm. it was a, we, we thought it was a one-off anomaly, and we thought if we just had it on video, right? And then mm-hmm. you have 20, 30, 40, 50 examples of people, black people being murdered on video. We're like, oh my God. When you think about that in the potential of AI to generate video, imagine the idea of it used to be it was like, okay, we see this thing and there's video, but we don't really know what happened. Could mm-hmm. nefarious police departments just generate video that gives them quote unquote, just cause to murder black people. It, that that may seem far-fetched, but it, it's this idea that when you have a tool with a few prompts, a few clicks of a button, you can have the average, entire, person. The average person, like not somebody who is super educated, somebody that has all these resources. They literally just go to a website, boom, 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 boom. That's yeah. scary. It, it, is, it is very scary. And the thing that I, I think about, I, I watched Oppenheimer. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think about nuclear weapons. What's interesting is that like, by this point in time, I think that 
the ability to make nuclear weapons, like people can make them, right? Like the know-how, the science behind it, but the world sort of got together and put in all these safeguards to make sure you can't get access to these materials and you can't do this in their inspections. Like we knew that nuclear weapons, certain people getting those, Bad right? Idea. Bad idea because if an individual gets nuclear warheads and you got the infrastructure to launch them, you wait, you know, your partner cheats on you, somebody you get fired from a job and boom, you set this, you set it off, right? With AI, the ability to just create fake information, propaganda, like, Crazy. All that stuff it's, it's, could be equally as dangerous. But we, as one, domestically as a government, aren't coming together to really confront this and think about how do we reckon yeah. with this and how do we put safeguards in place. And Private we, companies yeah, that exactly. are making decisions that are leading the charge. The government is is theater. Like you said, they it's don't theater. know anything about the AI. They couldn't, couldn't do it. it. Yeah. When they questioned Mark Zuckerberg in Congress, it was just the most revealing thing ever that they don't understand anything. They're too old. Mm -hmm. They, they don't are, get it. They, they don't get, I mean, they are not users of this stuff. And so they are being given a sheet with questions that was prepared by staff that they don't even know. It's like if somebody gave you a script and you don't even know the words on the, you read <laughs> from it, you sound ridiculous. On top of that, you, you yourself are barely able to stay awake. <laughs> so it's just, yeah. The other thing I was thinking about when it comes to AI, you know, I think about Sandra Bland because mm, yeah, one of the reasons we were all like she was murdered was because mm -hmm. of the way that the photo was taken. It looked like mm -hmm. she was exactly. laying down because her cheeks were sunken. Mm -hmm. If those police officers had had AI, they probably mm -hmm. would have been able to make it look like her cheeks were sunken. They would, would have never you would be able to manipulate. I mean, propaganda is not new. There has been propaganda and information warfare literally for all of time. But it's the yeah. ease in which AI allows it to happen in the yeah. in these mediums that we used to take as like sacrosanct in, in some ways. It's like, okay, video, you can't fake video. You can't fake two minutes and all these frames. But now you can. <clears throat> That's scary. Yeah. So not to be doomsday to anyone listening to this podcast, but this is the stuff that we think about, you guys. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff that Jeff and I are constantly thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. our responsibility, our our purpose in this world. And I encourage you all to also be worldly in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you may be heads down, juggling your kids, juggling your family, juggling your careers, trying to be healthy, going to the gym, trying to eat right, eat your protein. It's hard, you know? it's hard to balance all of that. It's hard. It's a lot. It's a lot. But I think that it's important that we all do not be completely disengaged from mm -hmm. what's happening. And we make an intentional choice to engage because it will require normal yeah. people like us. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the scope of the world, we are just normal people compared Absolutely. to the Bill Gates of the world and the Sam Altman's and all these other folks. And it will require us to ask questions. Mm -hmm. To and be to informed advocate, and to be engaged. And to be, you know, right. Absolutely. and it is an election year. I was thinking about, as it relates to this podcast, how political we were going to be. Like, is this something that we're going to talk about? And I don't think I can not, not talk about these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it is important. And, you know, what, what I will say is I know that people are disillusioned and disengaged and disappointed. I think that there is certainly a responsibility for the administration, if, if it wants to get a second term, to understand that realness out there yeah. and address it in a way that is responsible. But I, I view voting, and I've always viewed this, not just for president, but in every election, mm -hmm. local elections mm -hmm. and congressional elections and, and mm -hmm. uh, Senate elections. I think it's so important that you do vote. The thing that we learn as business owners, and, and hopefully the audience can relate to this, is that very rarely do you get perfect options, but you get options, yeah. right? You, you, you can either go this way or you can go that way. And you have to understand the trade-offs. And when you're given options, you, you make a choice and you understand what are the trade-offs with that choice? What, why is this choice? Why am I making this choice over this choice, right? The other choice may have some benefits. This choice has some benefits as well, but you have to understand what am I optimizing for? What, mm -hmm. is, what is important for me and what is this choice going to allow me to do? And how is it going to set me up to make another choice in the future that may ultimately get me closer to where I want to be? So I do think that our country in our politics is a journey, right? You know, to bring it back to the name of the show, right? It's a journey. And every four years, every two years, every year when we, when we vote, 
we have an opportunity to make a choice and how we, it's sort of like the choose your own adventure book. Whatever choice mm-hmm. we make or don't make either gets us further along in that journey or it sets us back. And so I, I just hope that people this year tune in and uh, become engaged and, and figure out what choice they want to make um, is, is what I hope. Can I get an amen? amen? Well, folks, this was a different type of podcast. Let me know what yeah. you think. Let Jeff and I know what you think in the comments send me a DM. I hope that you all continue to tune in as we navigate different topics and different conversations. And Jeff, thank you so much for sticking. Stick beside me. I'm going to stick beside <laughs> I'm going to stick beside you. <laughs> yes, always. Always. Appreciate it. Through the ups and downs of building this crazy world of Blavity Inc. To any of our employees who listen into the podcast, we appreciate you. All the former employees, we appreciate you. And, you know, I think that we got a crazy year out of us. So let's get, get, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Thanks for listening to the Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. And look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.